Last week we learned about the kingdom of God. And again, you know me, when I get on a series, I try to hang around because I want you to get it. I want you to know everything of what's trying to go, what I'm trying to get across to you, and the scripture's full of it. So last week we talked about the kingdom of God. You will see in the New Testament uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. There's a little bit of difference in there in that. Basically the same thing, but there's a difference in that he's approaching or talking to different people in the book of John as compared. And there's some other similarities there, okay? But we're talking about the kingdom of God. And last week it's, we learned that a, ki- a kingdom is a territory over which a king reigns. Okay, we read in the scripture that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this earth. It's not an earthly kingdom, and it's not of this world. Now, I want want y'all to get this right quick for me. If Jesus said he has a kingdom, then he is a king. And let me say what's pretty awesome about it. When I got to think about Jesus being a king, uh, he's a different king than we have on this earth. Think about Jesus. How many kings you know that would allow kids to come up and sit with him? How many kings you know would allow a person who was a, is caught in an adulterous affair, been married five times, how many kings you know would allow that in their presence? And that's what Jesus was. Jesus was a different type of king. And we're going to find out that God wants us to be uh, kings and queens and stuff on this earth today. And look at me. We need to look to Jesus as his example, how he handled himself as the king of glory and how he worked with people. And you know, some people get, I can tell, people get frustrated with me talking about these things. But if you look at the New Testament, that's just how Jesus dealt with people. In fact, it was the religious people, and I like what the uh, pastor said the other day. It was the religious people. Jesus is the one that got to whip and braided it and went back there and had a little discussion with the religious people. Jesus was a king, though, and he loved people. He loved kids. He, He loved dealing with people, and that's the type of king. And that's the kingdom that God wants to express here on this earth in us and through us. Now, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, it gets a lot of you nervous because you've never heard of it. You've heard of it, but it's some high pie in the sky thing. You don't understand it. But God said, Jesus says, I have a kingdom. It's not of this earthly order. I do things different than what kings of this earth do. It's a kingdom. And it's a kingdom that will manifest itself here on this earth with us if we allow Let's look at it real quick, right quick. Uh, Luke chapter 11, I read this last week, but I want, you to, I want you to understand and see this. You say I'm empowered by Satan. This is Luke chapter 11, verse 18. You say I'm empowered by Satan. This is Jesus talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees. But if Satan is divided and fighting against himself, how can his kingdom survive? And if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you, what you have said. But if I'm casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. So we see that even though Christ's kingdom is, in a sense, an invisible kingdom that he rules and reigns, it can manifest itself here on this earth. And what I want you to understand, and I have been teaching this for years to you all, but I don't think y'all get it, or somehow y'all think it's a fairy tale or a cartoon. I don't know, but this is what he says. The kingdom that I had, he says, I want to bestow this kingdom upon you. Let's read it. Let's look what the scripture says. I want to bestow this kingdom upon you. Look what he says right here. Uh, Luke uh, uh, 22, verses 28 through 30 says it like this. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. In other words, he's fixing to be crucified. Uh, If you're studying this, they're bringing him through trials and different things. They're fixing to carry him. He's fixing to go into the garden where he's sweating great drops of blood, all these things. And this is what he's talking to him here, okay? He said, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I have bestowed upon you a kingdom. Just as my father bestowed upon 
one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The word bestowed, y'all follow me now. The word bestowed means to give something such as a degree, award, a title, a right to, to someone or something. So look what God said here. Now y'all follow me. God says, I have a kingdom. Jesus said, I am a king and I have a kingdom. And think about some of the stuff he did. Man, he laid hands on the sick, he, those people that were depressed, all of those people that had issues and struggles, they come to Jesus. Jesus prayed for them. They were healed. The, all those that were oppressed of the devil, he healed them and seen them delivered. All of those things were taking place in his life. And he says, now look what I'm going to do. And this is where some of you don't believe. And that's how come you choose and you stay in a mediocre lifestyle. This is what Jesus just said. The kingdom that I have now, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to now give you the right to operate in that same kingdom the same way. Did y'all get that? That ought to make you want to shout and run around this church right there. That Jesus wants to take you. Now, I'm not talking to the whole congregation. I'm talking to you individually. God wants to take the kingdom of God that he has, the lifestyle that he lived on this earth, and he wants to bestow that kingdom upon you. That you may operate and work in those same things. The situation that we find ourselves in then is this. We find it easier to operate in the kingdom of darkness than we do in the kingdom of light. Y'all got that? We have find it easier to operate the way this world operates. You've done a good job operating. In fact, you live a blessed life. Things are going good. But let me ask you something. What is that doing for your heart and mind? Right. With everything you got, is it making you happy inside? Does it give you peace? The good news is God wants to give you all of those things, but also give you peace with it. He don't want you to have to toil. He wants this life to be a life of just enjoyment in the kingdom of God. But we have, a, we, ha we have a tendency to be able to live in that earthly kingdom better than when we do the God's kingdom that he wants to manifest in our life because we've learned to manipulate in that kingdom. We've learned to make things go our way in this kingdom until one day it don't. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> if you're listening, Mama, that just went off on somebody's phone, so I didn't want you to think I'm crazy, all right? So God has given you the right to operate in his kingdom. I don't know about you. I want to know how he operated in the kingdom. Do you understand that? I want to get into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and look at it. How, how did he operate in the kingdom? I already kind of told you a little bit. He just loved people, man. He didn't leave them there, but he loved them. He didn't shun them. He got to ground them and talked to them. And he got to the root of the issue on some things. He talked with them. That's how Jesus operated in the kingdom. It, again, it was the religious folks that he didn't do well with. And remember last week we talked about that the kingdom of God, folks, during Jesus' time, they were rushing to be a part of the kingdom of God. And today our churches are empty. Our churches are empty because people are not rushing in to want to be a part of the good news of the kingdom of God. Because I'll be honest with you, all they ever hear is the bad news rather than the good news. Now, y'all keep following me. Let's work through this. Look what he says in Revelation chapter 1, 5 through 6 says it like this. And from, and, from, and from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things. The first to rise from the dead, the ruler of all the kings of the world, all glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by the shedding of his blood for us. And look what he says here. He had made us kingdom of priests for our God 
of his father. Look what he says here. For you, if you're a born again child of God, God has given you, he made you, and he goes on to say, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's what God says for you. And until you as an individual begin to trust that for yourself, you will never be able to enter into what God's kingdom has for you. Do you realize that? Until you begin to realize you are not worthy upon yourself to receive this, but because of Jesus Christ and his righteousness and what he has done, I am now able to enter into the kingdom of God and God can use me to touch people's lives everywhere I go. The problem is, I'm telling you, you just don't believe it. And I'm gonna talk about that the next time I minister. The seed of the kingdom that fell among storms, the world choked it out or fell on rocky ground and the pressures of his life rocked it out. Many of us do not believe this about yourself. In fact, when somebody does begin to believe that about themselves, you knock them down. Look what he says here in John chapter 14. And I've read this passage before, but I want you to get it. I tell you the truth. John chapter 14, 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Why would God be able to do greater works when he goes to the Father through us? Why? Because we would be better in him? No, because now there's a whole bunch of hymns on this earth. Where he ruled as king here on this earth, now we're able to rule in his place. So guess what? He bestowed the kingdom upon me. He bestowed the kingdom upon Brother Rayford. He bestowed uh, Bestow the kingdom upon all of you individually. So now everywhere you go, in a sense, people should be seeing Jesus and what he's done. The problem is I'm just telling you something. You just don't believe it. You just don't believe it. You know why I believe it? I wouldn't have believed it if I wouldn't have read it in this book. I I just wouldn't have believed it. You mean God would take an uneducated person like myself and he would bestow upon me the kingdom? You mean God would take somebody like myself that didn't have it all together when I first got saved and he still bestowed the kingdom of God on me. I just, I mean, that's far from me. And that's where a lot of you today, you just can't, you just cannot believe it. And God says that's what he wants to do for you in life. But because this book says it, and I've researched this book to make sure I've studied over, I've looked at it, how can this thing be real and when I come become convinced that this book was real then I become convinced about what it said about me churches call me all the time since I build buildings stuff they want to know what do you think about this building and all the time I'm looking in my back of my brain honestly and I say if you honestly believe that people should be knocking down the doors to be in church why would you build a church this small? Or why would you build a building like this that you couldn't add on to? You know what I'm saying? Why, why would you build a building that wouldn't grow? Your vision for your life's too small. And I would say that about you as an individual. Is your vision for yourself way too small? Is your vision for your marriage, is your vision for your children, is it way too small? And I say for a lot of you, it is. Some of you don't speak up because you don't think you're what, you've got something valuable to say to people. And I say your story in life is valuable to people. What God has done for you, what he's doing for you is valuable. And because so many of you just stay silent, the world suffers around us. And nobody has told them, you're walking into the darkness and where we should be the light of the world. And I'm chasing a bunch of rabbits right now. But where you should be the light of the world, we're just, you know, hide it under a bushel. No, we're going to let it shine. You believe that when you're a kid, but when you become an adult, we hide it. 
See, we can understand, and I'm going to try to help you understand something. We can understand in the kingdom of God that God has bestowed upon us through a framework of three different words, okay? And I want you to get this. Number one, we're going to talk about dwelling. Number two, we're going to talk about dominion. Number three, we're going to talk about dynasty, and I want you to get it. So everybody say with me, dwelling, dominion, dynasty. See, if we would believe in those three things, and what I'm going to lay out for us today is if you would believe these type of things, then you would carry yourself different in this world. In fact, you would require your children to carry themselves a little bit different. You hear me? Not that they're self-right. You would require your children. No, 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 we're not going to operate this way. This is how we're going to handle things. So number one, dwelling. What do I mean by dwelling? From the very beginning, y'all follow me. From the very beginning, God's intention is to dwell with us. You got that? From the very beginning, God's intention was to dwell with us. To dwell, not just dwell with us in general, to dwell with you individually. In other words, you would be a carrier of God's presence. We see that automatically in the Garden of Eden. What did God do? God created Adam and Eve, and the first thing he did, he come walking in the garden, talk to Adam and Eve, and begin to commune with him. Guess what? He created them and walked amongst them, even though he knew they messed up. The first thing he did is what? He went out and did a sacrifice, which was going to be pointing to what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, and clothed them. Why? Because God's number one desire is for you to be a dwelling place for him to be able to take up residence in. You know why? Because if he can live within us, then his kingdom can it be expressed to the world around us. It never was about you or what you could have, should have done. It was always about him creating a place to live within you to be able to minister to you and through you to the world around you. Let's look at it right quick. Number two, Abraham. What's the first thing God did? God come to Abraham in the midst of all the different gods they were worshiping in that time. And what do? God come to Abraham and walk with Abraham. He become a friend with Abraham. They, they talked about the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything. Abraham became a friend of God. And when the world went south, guess what happened? Or went crazy again? Guess what he did? He said, look at me. I want you to set up a tabernacle in the wilderness in the midst of your darkest time. I want you to set up a tabernacle you know why I want to come down and dwell amongst my people where people can see my glory where people can see what I'm wanting to do in life God from the very beginning is wanting to dwell with us he wanted to be our God he wanted to establish a kingdom on this earth here that he can flow through and work of work through us and but you know what the problem is y'all say it with me I just don't believe Then what did he do? Jesus born on this earth in a manger. And what's the very word we use? Emmanuel, what? God with us from the very beginning. God has wanted to come and dwell with his people and be with his people. And then guess what happened? He would, he would, Jesus would come and walk along the side of us. Jesus walked on this earth and guess what he was doing? He was giving us a full expression of what God was like because the religious world made him out to look bad. And God says, you want to know what God's like? Just read about me in Matthew and that's what God's like. Just read about me in the book of Mark and that's what God's like. Like, look at Luke and John. If you want to know what God is like, don't always listen to every preacher unless they're telling you out of the book. He said, if, if what preachers are preaching today is contrary to the way Jesus lived on this earth, then they're preaching the wrong gospel. They're preaching the wrong gospel. Jesus said, look, God with us. Here I am. I'm dwelling among. This is what God is like. And then he said, guess what? I'm fixing to depart but guess what I'm going to do? You are now going to be a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm no longer going to dwell in a tabernacle. I'm no longer going to just walk amongst you. Guess what I'm going to do? I am now going to come in and take up residence within you. And the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, that the Holy Spirit descended. And guess what? He fell upon people to live within them, to work within them, and to empower them. 
You got that to empower them to work in the kingdom of God. Not for you to speak in tongues and sit in your house all by yourself. He wanted to empower you that you could go out and work and move in the power of the Holy Spirit of God in the world that you're living in. But some of you just don't believe it. You believe the lies the enemy has told you. You believe the lies that the enemy has spoken through your family, your children, your ex-husband, your future husband, whatever it is. You believe the lies. And Brother Damon said, stop it. Just believe what the book says about you. What does the book say? What does the Word of God say? Because I tell you what, this whole world's crazy. This world will beat you down. This, this world will make you go home and make you feel like throwing in the towel and quit. But you know what I got to do? I got to renew my mind on what the Word of God says and be not conformed to what this world says, but you know what? be transformed by what? The renewing of my mind. And you know what? I just believe it. I just believe it. I believe it when I can't pronounce a word that the, it's in the Bible. I still believe it. But some of you just don't believe it. And you act like it. Not being mean, you act like it. You don't carry yourself a certain way. And then... If you look at Revelations 21, 3, when all this is said and done, John said, I look up and I seen a new heaven and a new earth descending. See, we're not going to be in heaven with wings flapping like a lot of you think. We're gonna, not going to be up for all our whole rest of our life with little gold wings walking on the streets of gold. No, he's bringing this uh, tabernacle back down to this earth, glory to God. And we're going to, well, look what he says right now. I don't want you to think I'm crying. I want you to listen to what he says. Look at him right here. He said, <clears throat> and I, Revelation 21, 3 says, And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with him. Look at me. God's number one intentions from the very beginning, guess what? Is to, that's what he told the nation of Israel. I, I, I want the whole world to see the wisdom of God through you people. And look what God's wanting to say. He's wanting to let you know, I want God's glory to be manifested through his people, through us. Don't you know people scratching their head all over Mississippi right now? In, in North Mississippi. There's churches in this area scratching their head. They're wondering why they must be doing something wrong up there to be growing. They gotta be, they gotta be watering the gospel. They gotta be, they got to be doing something. What they don't know is D learned a long time ago within myself, I am nothing but a mess up. I'll mess things up tomorrow if I depend upon myself. But I learned a long time ago that Jesus is my refuge. He is my strength. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. And if I would just step back, look, if I'll just step back in the midst of everything going crazy and say, what you got planned on here, God? What, what's on your mind here? If you'll let me know what's on your mind right now, then we will do this. And guess what? I ain't got to go to the cross to find him. I ain't got to go to the church to find him. I ain't got to get on my knees to find him. He's with me. And he will open my ears to hear what he's got to say if we're willing to listen. But you know why that happens to me? I believe it. Everybody say, I believe it. Say, so you've got to believe this. And you'll do great things for the kingdom of God. See, if you read all, it's pretty clear to me that God wants to be my friend and God wants to dwell with me. Number two is dominion. Everybody say dominion. See, the word dominion basically means a guide for a course of action. He wants us to prevail, to govern, to oversee. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to prevail in every circumstance. And he didn't say the circumstances would come. He just said, I want you to prevail in those circumstances. I want you to bring order to the circumstances and situations. I want you to oversee every, I want you to oversee the kingdom of God in your realm of operation. And see, again, some of you don't believe it. Did, to some of you, this is high pie in the sky stuff. You just, this is, my Lord, what you've been smoking, preacher? 
But it's in the word. It's, it's in the book. Look what he says here in Genesis 1.27. This is, he created Adam and Eve. Look what he says. This was God's original intention for man. Then God created human beings in his own image. Why in his own image? Did God have an arm like that? That ain't what he's talking about. Image means a mind, will, and emotion just like he does. God wants to come in and heal our mind, will, and emotion. That way we can operate like he originally designed us for. Y'all follow me now because some of you are tired and about ready to fall asleep because you just don't believe this. You, you don't believe this. You've been taught that if I can get enough master degrees and enough education and enough money, then I'll be successful. And I'm telling you right now, success has nothing to do with none of those things. Success has everything to do. Am I fulfilling what God's purpose is for my life? Am I, am I doing where, that's where I'm the happiest. That's that's where the joy that's where I operate the best at when I'm doing what God wants me to do look what he says here so God created human beings in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female everybody say it male and female all righty, so we got to just stop all the craziness okay he created them and then God blessed them and said be fruitful multiply Fill the earth and do what? Govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea. Now, you tree huggers, look at me. I'm sorry. If a deer walks out in front of you, slay the joker. That's what God told you to do. If you don't like it and you don't like Bambi getting killed, then you need to stay at home and let Papa bring home some meat a little bit later. That's what's the matter with men today. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. That's Melanie. When Landon was around me and he was a little one, she was like, oh, a bug, a bug. I said, come over here, boy, come over here. Stomp on that bug. Tell that bug you're going to die today. Huh? That's what would our matter with our men today. They've been around women too long. They need to be around a man who loves God and loves people, and we can train them up some. I'm just telling you the truth. We need some men that recognize they are kings and priests and I'm everything that God created me to be and I'll stop allowing the world to tell me what I am. I'll stop allowing the world to put me down because I will be the one who sets the atmosphere wherever we go. I believe it. Everybody say, I believe it. Look what he said. He said, I want you to fill the earth and govern it. That's what dominion is, to govern, to rule over. That means when you come into a situation that's looking bad, God put you there. You can step back and say, God, what do you want to do with this? We need to correct this. We need to bring some light into darkness here. And you know some of you men, the reason why half of y'all get yourself in trouble, when you see a damsel in distress, get what? Everything in you wants to go help fix that. It's because you were created to have rule and dominion. But he gives us guidelines in which you need to step into to do that. I don't know why I'm chasing this rabbit, but somebody in here needs to hear. Most of the time, men do not cheat because of sex. Men cheat because somehow, someway, somebody has blown smoke on them long enough to make them feel like a king. So what happened to Samson? Remember Delilah? Boy, where'd you get those muscles at, boy? Rubbed his head. He's like, oh, oh, oh. I can't do this. I can't do this. I shouldn't be doing this. Oh, come on, sugar. Tell me your secret. Everybody say move on. So, so what does it look like for a believer to have dominion in a fallen world? Let's look at, right, let's look at the first man, Jesus, the second Jesus, okay? Look at, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. At the, and listen to me, in the time of the Lord's favor, listen, at the time of the Lord's favor, got that? His favor has come. 
The word anointing means to authorize, to set apart a person for a particular work. Y'all follow me. Please follow me. It ain't number 1121. We can't go up there anyway. The kids are probably eating right now. Just, just follow me. Will you follow me? See, the reason why some of you are having a hard time because you just don't believe this. Man, I, if I believed it, I'd be like, tell me something else. Tell me. What else do we got here? Tell me. See, you can believe the anointing on Jesus, but let's move on down a little and let's see what Jesus uh, says about us. See, 2 Corinthians 1, 20 and 22 says like this, For all the promises of God are in him, yea and amen, unto glory of God by us. Now, which he, now he which establishes us with you in Christ has what? Anointed us. That means he has authorized you. He has set you apart for a particular, a particular work or service. That's what he's done. But so many of you do not believe it. And you allow this world to order you. Go to work. Come home. Pay the bills. Go to work. Go home. Pay the bills. Listen to the wife gripe. Listen to the husband gripe. Listen to the children go and slap nuts. Instead of saying, whoa, wait a minute, this is my domain here. And we're going to bring a little bit of order to this place. If I hear you mouth off to your mama one more time, son, I'm going to knock your head across the room here. Not that hard, but you know what I'm saying. You hear me saying? If I listen, set up order, stop being passive. Be man, I'm this is what I'm about. Everybody say, Woo, he's preaching today hard, hard, he's hard, he's hard. He done talked about adultery and beating the kids and all that stuff. See, God's, uh, God's called you to bring light into darkness. That's what he's called you to. He, he, you're, the, you're the light of the world. Hey, look, he's called you to come into dark situations. He's called you to rule as a king and a priest in their area. You may not like it. You may think I'm talking. But God wants you to step on the scenes and just deal with certain issues in the kingdom way. You say, well, would Jesus knock your kid's head off? And I've never knocked my kids off. I have grabbed them by the hair of the head and said, no, you ain't going to do that. But, uh, you know. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and I have probably popped one of them upside the face too before if I had to. Like my mama did me. I have, you be quiet over there, okay? <laughs> Do, let, let me ask you real quick, and I'm being serious, but I loved you, didn't I? I was the lion and the lamb in my house. I love my kids. I laid hands on them every night and prayed for a crazy joker like Nate, and I didn't even know Nate was his name. Same thing with Hillary. I laid hands and I prayed for them and I trust, believed God for them and wanted God's best for them and loved them, hugged neck, prayed for them, worshiped in front of them, spoke in tongues in front of them. I did all that in front of them. I wanted them to see that in me. But I can tell you right now, if things get out of order and chaos starts coming in, guess what D's going to do? Start chopping heads. I'm just telling you right now, boop, we ain't going to do this. And that's not being rude or being mean. That's just us coming in and establishing things and setting rules and setting things instead of being so passive about stuff, okay? Bringing light in the darkness. You are the light of the world, Mark says. Bringing order into chaos. And then my last point, dynasty. Dynasty. What does that mean? It means what you do, your children to do. Either good dynasty or bad dynasty, but what you do, your children are going to do. And I can tell you, my children have far surpassed me. They know more about God at their age. They know more about the kingdom of God at their age. They have, they're successfully financially more than I am at... Uh, even now at my age, they're, they, you know, and that's the way it should be. Dynasty. 
Look at his scripture here. What is the dynasty? Dynasty is succession. What, what you do is pass down to somebody else. And you know what? I got some spiritual sons and daughters. I got spiritual sons. That's how come some of you, no, 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 that ain't how we're going to do things, no. I don't do that to every guy. But some of you, I say, no, that, no, no. Get your butt back in there and do that. Okay? Listen to this right here. We're closing. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I remember, remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And now that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gifts God gave you when I laid my hands upon you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power, look at his word, power in love and a sound mind. Y'all get that? What I've seen in your grandmother and what I've seen in your mother, I now see in you. Did you check this out? My great grandmother, and I didn't know this till later, my great grandmother, and I only met her a couple of times, babysitted Joe Osteen went to his church as a child. My mother said that she would go into the closet and put her, and my mother said as a child she could hear her speaking in tongues in the closet, praying in tongues. And this is what I found. If you drop the ball, that blessing will jump to the next generation. You hear me? It will jump your kids or jump you and go right on to the next kids of people to be a blessed. I want my world to see what's in me. I want to see a dynasty of people who live for the kingdom of God. Okay? So in conclusion, God has bestowed upon us a kingdom. How are you going to govern it? Are you going to bring light into darkness? Are you going to bring order into chaos? Or will you be timid and passive and allow the world around us to go nuts. How will you govern your children? How will you govern your children? How will you govern your relationship? Have y'all destroyed your marriage relationship? Are y'all destroying it because, sir, you've been passive or you've been too dominant and there You ask my wife, when I see her getting too busy or something's going on, I just come in and put my foot down and say, okay, it's time for you to chill out a little bit. It's time to, and she'll tell me the same thing if something's going wrong with me. Do you have enough of, have you been around each other? You know, come on, I'm talking to somebody. It's time sometimes, somebody got to bring some order into things because if you don't bring order into your relationships and stuff, if you don't, it will destroy, and there's a ripple effect that goes out a whole lot further than you could ever imagine. I'm reminded, look at me. Remember, Abraham did something crazy, remember? Turned around, his son did something crazy. Said, that's my sister, and that was his wife. Well, that's my sister, man. Don't kill me, man. Take her, that's my sister. Turned around, Jacob did the exact same thing. And the reason why all this happens is you don't believe. You don't believe that you're something special. You don't believe it, so you submit yourself to this worldly junk. Well, the sad thing about it is you say you're being you you know, this is who I am. That ain't who you are. You're doing that to rebel against the system. The problem is you're rebelling against the wrong system.
Look at me. I'm not trying to be tough, but I'm just telling you, some of you just don't believe this. You're going to leave here today, and that was a good little message and move on. But let me tell you, some of you young people, y'all need to believe it. You need to begin to believe it about yourself. I see more kids cry today because they don't, I mean, they beautiful line drop bow, and somebody catches in the outfield, and they go crying. I want to grab them by the mask. Will you stop crying? That was a beautiful hit. This somebody got in the way. Stop it. Let's man up. Everybody say that's enough preaching. I can't handle it no more. Everybody just say, I believe it. And I love what the book of Joel says. He says, I will restore everything that the canker worm, see the canker worm come through and strip most everything. Then the palmer worm come through and took what the, took the rest of it. He said, look what I'll do for you. I'll restore to you the years that was taken from you. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. That's what he was talking about. You're now the dwelling of the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. He wants you to begin to exercise dominion. Not in a mean way. Just whatever, you know, do it a godly way. He's a redeemer of our time. He's a... He's a redeemer of our mistakes. I like what Chris told me today. He hope I ain't stepping around. He said, I called my dad. Come up here right quick, Chris. Come up here. Bring me my mic right quick. Shane. Turn my mic on right quick. I'm, 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 this, is, this is a, you know what? He's got tattoos on him. He just got saved. He probably say a cuss word every once in a while. Hopefully he gets out of that, but we'll do it. Okay, I guess you do. I don't know. Tell, tell the people a little bit what you did for your dad and what it did for the people around him. Just, just share a little bit. So uh, my dad and my mom were both uh, drug addicts my whole life. We, uh, they were never really part of my life as much as they wanted to be. Um, my mom ended up dying of a drug overdose in 2017. My dad accepted Christ in 2010, and uh, he's been sober um, ever since him. So uh, a few weeks ago, God really just put forgiveness on my heart. I'd been thinking about it, um, and my dad came into my mind, and for once in, the, in, in a while, I had asked myself if I had truly forgiven my dad, even though I told him that I had, you know, and I realized that I hadn't. Um, Probably about 95% of myself did, but there was still a little bit that I, for my own selfish reasons, I held on to, just so that when I messed up, I could fall back on that, you know, and say, well, my dad did this to me, or I went through this when I was little. So I called my dad a couple weeks ago. I said, Dad, um, I'm calling you for a reason. I said, I just want to tell you that, that I forgive you and that I love you. And... You know, for the, what made me think about it, I've, and I told Brother D this this morning, I've heard him say so many times, love and compassion. And for the first time in my life, I thought how my dad must have felt dealing with the things that he did, even after he had gone to God. And even after God said, Joel, you're good, knowing that he still had to deal with that was something that I truly did not want him to have to deal with. Because I thought about my son. I thought about doing that to my son. And after me coming clear to God or in being forgiven by God, still having to think about my son dealing with that stuff. And I truly, I didn't want my dad to have to deal with that. So all of that stemmed from love and compassion. You know, I think about I think about what Jesus went through on that cross for all of us, you know, and I think about him being beat, him being tortured, him being ridiculed and spit on, 
And then they hang him on the cross, and the first thing that he says, he looks up, and he says, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then I thought about that, and then I thought, who am I? Who am I to say that I should hang on to something when Jesus, just like that, he didn't think about it. He didn't say, God, give me some time. Let me, let me think about it. Right then, he said, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So I, I called my dad. Sorry to get off track. I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm just calling to tell you that I love you, and then I forgive you. And he said, Son, I've been waiting on this call for 20 years. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was beautiful. And the thing about forgiveness, it's beautiful when you're asking for it, right? But all of a sudden, when you're the one being asked to give it, it's not so beautiful all of a sudden, right? And I realized that forgiveness isn't for the other person. Forgiveness is truly for you. And it, it sadly, it took me a really long time to learn that. And along with that, I learned that as long as you're mad, as, you, as long as you're angry and bitter, you stay the victim. You stay in that prison because you truly cannot heal and hate at the same time. It's, it's not possible. So my dad called me this week, uh, Thursday, and we were just talking, you know, talking and whatnot. And he said, son, uh, so I don't know if I said this. Now my dad goes into prisons and ministers to men that are incarcerated. That's how he says it. That's how he gets high now. So, yeah, anyway, so he called me on Thursday. He's like, son, I want to tell you this. I went into the unit in Dallas on earlier in the week. And normally he said there's 40 or 50 people in there. But at this time there were 90 people there. And I wasn't, he totally caught me off guard when he said this. He said, I shared your phone call with these men the other day. And he said, at the end of the service, 83 of those men came forward. <laughs> Praise God. And he, he went on to tell me that a lot of men that are incarcerated struggle with broken relationships that they're responsible for. And he just said that through that story, he said half the men that came forward were just crying like babies, you know, and a few of them, he didn't have a chance to talk with all of them because he's on a limited time while he's there. But several men came up to him and said, Joel, I for once in a long time have faith again. I have faith through your story, through Jesus, that all of these people, all of the relationships that I've damaged can be restored again. And as I was telling Brother D this morning, it, it all stemmed, and I'm not, I'm not saying this for my own self-righteous reason, because Chris Lott did not do that. Jesus gave me the strength that I needed to make that phone call, but it all stemmed from truly love and compassion, you know, and it's very difficult, and I'm sure there's one person in this room right now that's hearing me that's saying, is he talking to me right now? And, you know, I'm not, but God may be. And if there's someone that you've been thinking about for a long time, whether it's an, an aunt, a mother, a grandmother, a coworker, whatever it is, make today the day. Give them a call so that not only just so that you can start the healing process, because as long as you stay angry, you truly stay the victim. Um, but anyway, thank you all. God bless. Hey, and so why don't... What I don't, why don't I go on to do this? And I had no plans on doing this. If you're here and you're haunted by past relationships, mistakes, kids, children, it's just can't seem to get over it. When you look at them, you look at your children, you see shame instead of victory. I want you to take a step of faith and just come up here wing and nobody will be around you unless they're beside you and just do something crazy like this just let it go and when you get up I want you to get up as a daughter of the king a king's kid I want you to get up and start living it like, like that instead of always living in the shadows 
If that's you, why don't you make your way down here? I know there's multitudes here for that. Gotta let it go. Just let it go. It does not have to dominate your life. 